Undertale was pretty weird, wasn't it? Who'd have thought that a scrappy indie game developed by a relative unknown would become such a massive hit that still kick it around in the public discourse coming up on four years on? Now with the release of Deltarune, Undertale's sequel, follow-up, sidequel, alternate universe meta fanfic thing officially in production, and with a shiny new demo out to similar rave reviews, it's got me thinking about, well, what Undertale was actually about. That seems like a straightforward question, but for the life of me, I couldn't actually figure out a satisfying answer. The internet was no help either. You'd need to wade through an obscene amount of Steven Universe song parodies that are somehow more popular than the originals, a bunch of webcomics, and of course, game theory. Only to discover that no one's really attempted a comprehensive reading before. Between you and me, I think Undertale itself is at least partially to blame here because the game seems to deliberately avoid coming to any sort of thematic conclusion, all while throwing an endless stream of unrelated concepts and ideas at you. Is it about violence? Well, kind of. Maybe dealing with grief? Not quite, but there's definitely something there. The game's got to be about something, right? That's why it fell to me to desperately try and wrangle some sort of cohesive reading out of a game that actively resists any attempt to pin it down. Well, after many a sleepless night, I think I've managed to crack it. Oh, just a heads up by the way, pretty much everyone has played Undertale, so I'll be abridging quite a lot of the plot so this video isn't like 90 minutes long. I think that unlike a lot of other metafictional games, like the Stanley Parable or Bioshock, which focus much more on the creation of games, Undertale's metafiction deals much more intimately with how and why we play games and engage with stories in the first place. But to understand that, we're gonna have to go right back to the beginning. Buckle up. I think if there was anything about Undertale that has yet to receive the praise it deserves, it's the first five or so minutes. The introduction of the game is this rollercoaster ride of subverted expectations and deceptions that excellently sets the stage for what's to come. There's the subverted intro where it turns out the big bad monster army lost, there's the fact that you're playing a different character to the one in the intro, there's Flowey turning out to be evil, only for him to be replaced by Toriel, who's nice. It's complete narrative whiplash, and for a very good reason. Once Toriel takes the lead, any anchoring Undertale has to a typical gaming opening is shattered when she skips you past what's obviously supposed to be a training puzzle and then tells you you're not supposed to kill the randomly spawning monsters. Don't kill the monsters? In an RPG? What the hell is this game even trying to do? Well, it is a tutorial, just not for the thing you think it is. Chances are you already know how to solve basic puzzles and play an RPG, Undertale is actually teaching you how to analyse stories. Undertale wants you to make decisions in the full knowledge that you are a player playing a game, not as if you are part of the world. The problem is that we've been so conditioned into experiencing games a certain way that Undertale needs to break down what you know so that you can approach things from a fresh perspective. Just before Toriel lets us off the leash to start the ruins proper, there's a scene where she tests your independence by having you walk across this room without her. This seems like pretty straightforward characterization of Toriel, and there's also a cute easter egg where you can find her hiding behind this pillar, but it's actually a subtextual hint to the player that they'll need to rely on their own intuition in order to make it through, as demonstrated by the fact that you need to defy her in order to continue. Despite teaching you how combat works just minutes ago, Undertale doesn't let up. Each of the different monster types in the ruins all work slightly differently to how you'd expect them to. For example, Whimson will automatically spare itself, and you're actually supposed to run into some of Vegetoid's bullets in spite of what you learn from Flowey. Undertale, rather than keeping its metafiction for a late game twist, never wants you to get fully immersed. All the weird tricks and twists it pulls aren't supposed to be particularly challenging, they're meant to prevent you from settling into a routine. This causes you to be constantly aware of how you're experiencing the game, rather than absorbing it passively. This is proven at the end of the ruins. Once you're reunited with Toriel, she nicely takes you into her nice house, bakes you a nice pie, and gives you a nice room to stay in. Which is very… uh… lovely of her. However, it quickly dawns on you through talking to her and poking around in the various rooms that not only does she have no intention of letting you go, you aren't the first kid she's adopted this way. Tutorial character subverted once again. When you try to escape, Toriel goes to destroy the exit to the ruins, and enters a fight with you. 
The catch though is that as you lose health, Toil's attacks will also do less damage, and eventually they'll avoid you entirely. In effect, Toriel can't actually kill you. This serves a dual purpose, both to demonstrate Toriel's mercy, but also to kind of frustrate you. Toriel is the hardest enemy to beat pacifist style in the whole game, and I think that's deliberate. See, in order to beat Toriel, you can't talk to her like you can with every enemy up until this point, and sparing her doesn't really appear to do anything, even going so far as to repeat the same responses to trick you into thinking you've exhausted her dialogue. Most players, based on this evidence, will conclude that they're going to have to reluctantly fight Toriel and get a nasty surprise when they out of nowhere do about 15 times more damage, killing her instantly. This is an emotional gut punch, and rather than simply accepting it as part of the story, your new metafictional perspective is all too aware that you've failed, that you could have saved her if only you'd done better. Two things happen here. Either you'll be locked into the so-called neutral ending of the game where you've killed at least one person, and the memory of killing Toriel will drive you to think more carefully in the future, or more likely, you'll realise, oh hang on a minute, this is a game. You can just reload your save and not kill her this time. In doing this, you've accepted Undertale's nature as a game that you can manipulate. Well done. But it's not done with you yet. Moments after killing or saying goodbye to Toriel, Flowey pops back up and has a bit of a chat with you. If you successfully spared Toil first time round, he'll taunt you about eventually needing to kill out of frustration and give a vague warning about his future plans, but a far more interesting bit of dialogue gets shown if you reload to save her. Flowey knows what you did, he knows you used the power to save in order to bend causality to your will, and in doing so, replaced him as de facto manipulator of time and space. This revelation that you're somehow like Flowey kind of makes you feel gross and guilty, like you cheated. And that's something that's difficult to rationalise away because, well, you did. You bent the rules of the game so that you could feel better about yourself. Even if you didn't save Toriel, you're confronted with the fact that you could have saved her, but chose not to. And without Undertale's help, you would have never been able to realise what that decision really meant. Media has the power to teach us things about ourselves, and that's what the next area is all about. You meet Sans the Skeleton in a genuinely creepy scene where he ambushes you in the woods, immediately after being told how dangerous the world outside the ruins is. Luckily, Sans is pretty cool, and he's quickly followed by his brother Papyrus, who initially wants to capture and or kill you. The main problem you have to face in Snowdin is the repeated and entirely unsuccessful attempts by the Great Papyrus to capture you and haul you off to the monster capital. These little interactions are the absolute highlight of Snowdin for sure. Each one is a little vignette that shows Papyrus' very ambitious schemes crumbling around him, usually owing to his own incompetence. My favourite is this randomly generated and ridiculously complicated labyrinth puzzle he sets up, only for it to generate in the easiest possible solution. It's brilliant. However, the highlight of Snowden from a conceptual point of view is the emphasis on the power of stories and media to give us the chance to self-reflect. Let's start with the obvious stuff, the random monster encounters. In the ruins, getting rid of baddies non-violently required maybe some out-of-the-box thinking, but it was never particularly hard. Here though, and for the rest of the game, non-lethal solutions to monster encounters are a fair bit trickier than the alternatives. Each one requires surviving multiple bullet hell rounds as well as actually paying attention to the monsters, which isn't something most RPGs have you do. For example, the only way to pacify Snowdrake is to realise he wants to be a comedian, perform a neutral action so he tells a joke, and then laugh at it to show that he's funny. It's quite a lot of work to put in considering that running away also keeps you on the pacifist track, and you'll only really miss out on money, which is basically everywhere anyway. Murder, on the other hand, will lower the encounter rate permanently on top of making future fights easier by levelling you up and giving you more HP. The choice to care about the monsters, sacrificing an expanded health pool and perhaps more importantly your time, is a difficult one to make and one that gradually becomes more frustrating. This is deliberate. Undertale is once again offering you a chance to interrogate yourself, to figure out how you feel and to make an informed choice about whether you care about these monsters. After all, it's much harder to bludgeon greater dog to death after you learn he just wants some pets. Aww. This self-interrogation is also why Undertale likes asking you weird, pointless questions all the time. There's no option not to answer the question, and no rewards for either answer, so your eventual choice forces you to look inwards. Do you prefer Junior Jumble, or are you a dirty liar? Do you prefer, you know, Sans, or the Great Papyrus? You might subconsciously already know the answer, 
but Undertale offers you an opportunity to consciously figure out your own opinions and biases and act accordingly. All this is shown in very clear terms through your interactions with Papyrus. Just like how playing Undertale has given us a chance for some introspection, so has playing the game of Monsters vs Humans offered Papyrus a chance for a bit of soul searching himself. Over time, Papyrus goes from directly adversarial in the first puzzle, to helpful in the XOXO puzzle, and by the end, he even deactivates the deadly Gauntlet of Terror because he's realised something about himself. Papyrus isn't violent, he just wants approval and friendship, and learning that has made him realise that he doesn't actually want to hurt you, just like the other monsters you've met. Of course, you've learned stuff too. At the start of Snowdin, Sands appeared pretty sinister and Papyrus looked like a credible if bumbling threat. However, now you know the Skelly Bros, as well as the other sentries, are basically harmless, all because, for a brief moment, your personal story and theirs intersected and you were both able to learn from each other. This is what I mean when I say Undertale is metafiction as it relates to audiences. While there are some obvious parallels between Toby Fox and Papyrus as two people who both make games, most of the metafictional commentary centres around us and how humans can learn from stories, even if they don't realise it. However, our relationship with stories is a little bit more complicated than that, something the next area, Waterfall, goes into in more detail. But before that, please give me a moment to gush about the dating scene with Papyrus, it's not really relevant at all to my reading, but it is however, the funniest bit in the whole goddamn game. Look at his outfit, he's so cool, and the music, ah, oh, it's so good, and, and, and crime radar, crime radar. Egg. <clears throat> okay, right. Back to serious talk. All right, I'm gonna level with you. Waterfall is probably the least interesting area Undertale has to offer. The puzzles don't have much in the way of subtext. There aren't very many interesting baddies to talk to, and there is a lot of walking around. Yeesh. The main focus of this area is your repeated run-ins with the scary Captain of the Royal Guard, Undyne as well as learning about the history of the war with humanity, and that's where I want to start. The most obvious theme that runs through the entire history of humans and monsters is that it wasn't a fair fight, it was a total bloodbath. Not a single human was killed, and countless monsters were destroyed. The game makes it very clear that monsters and humans aren't equal, it'd take the souls of nearly every monster in the underground just to match the strength of yours, no wonder Asgore wants to get his hands on them. There's some interesting parallels between the continuing human-monster hostility and our relationship with fiction, human beings who evolved to understand the world through the medium of stories. In the olden days, humans used to tell stories of gods moving the sun across the sky. It was wrong, but it did correctly explain the idea of days, and things haven't really changed that much since. The point is, humans learn through stories, and because those stories inform so much of our understanding, people tend to get quite attached to them. When confronted by someone who's experienced different stories, or the same stories from a different perspective, and has come to different conclusions, the default human response is, well, violent rejection. It's this pushing away of things that contradict our worldview that has informed basically all of human history. Cultures clash, people die, no one has a good time. This is what happened when the differences between humans and monsters became too great, and the humans won. Now, this is the part where you're probably expecting me to say we should be tolerant of everyone and respect everybody's beliefs, right? Eh, not quite. What we need to do is to keep an open mind. This is made blindingly obvious when you face Undyne. She, unlike Papyrus or Toil, really wants to kill you. She's convinced that humans are evil. So convinced, in fact, that she'll break orders so she can fight you sooner and lie about every monster wanting you dead, even though you know for a fact that isn't true. In combat, Undyne can't be reasoned with, and unlike Toriel, she can't even be worn down. In fact, it just makes Undyne angrier if you don't validate what she already thinks. It's very easy for violently inclined players to write her off as someone who will never see your side of the story, and in doing so, they ensure that they won't see hers either. The solution to beating Undyne as a pacifist, as with any other monster, is to make an effort to understand who she is, what she wants, and importantly, what she believes and it's only by realising that Undyne wants to kill you because she thinks you're a threat that you can do something about that. You've got to run away until she passes out from exhaustion and then prove her wrong, whether she likes it or not, breaking that cycle of violence. Then you can go to Undyne's house and, like with Papyrus, help them realise something important about herself through the medium of play, namely that humans are not actually a threat 
and that friendship is the greatest competition of all. I'm not keeping that in, I'm cutting that, Jesus Christ. Even though she wanted to kill us, it's through understanding Undyne that we were able to beat her without fighting and outright rejecting her worldview, learning some valuable lessons about why the monsters feel the way they do in the process. However, Undertale also makes it clear that whilst we should keep an open mind and we should analyse everything to try and learn from everyone, it doesn't mean everyone is right. Take the Mad Dummy miniboss for example. They're unique in of the fact that they've got almost no redeeming features, offer no real opportunities to learn, and refuse to do so themselves. You can't even really beat them pacifistically, naps the Bluecast to step in and chase them off. The enemy of Undertale, such as it exists, isn't people who disagree with you and hold a different worldview like Undyne and at one time most of the monsters, because we have a lot to learn from people or stories we disagree with. No. The real enemy of Undertale is those who, for whatever reason, refuse to admit that there's any valid way of looking at things other than their own. People who isolate themselves away from any evidence to the contrary, and as a result, are unable to learn anything about the world, let alone about themselves. People like Flowey, for example, who's incapable of seeing beyond his kill or be killed shtick. This revelation also points to a solution to the monster's problems at large. We need to set them free and reopen a dialogue with humanity, because the two groups have a lot to learn from each other. Such as, just to pull an example from the top of my head here, the wonders of anime and video games. But we'll get to that. The end of Waterfall is near enough the halfway point of the game, and also where Undertale goes from setting up our knowledge of our relationship with stories to showing the consequences. In the ruins we were introduced to the idea that Undertale is a game about the way we play games and engage with stories. We're also taught to understand the importance of self-awareness and a critical eye when examining texts. Snowden follows up on this realisation by explaining how stories can allow us to understand the world and ourselves better, and in doing so, prepare us for life's challenges. And Waterfall is all about understanding that we often react violently when introduced to ideas that challenge our own, but that's an impulse we have to fight, because the more we reject the outside world, the more isolated we become, and we lose out on precious opportunities to learn and become better people. That's something we'll find out all about in the next area. I'll make no secret of it, Hotland is my favourite area in the whole game. Every set piece is just bursting with personality, and the main two characters on display get almost constant screen time. And a good thing too, because Hotland is really all about putting what we've learned into practice as we meet, and then break down, the characters of Alphys and Metaton. The initial impression of Alphys we get is that she's kind of a joke character. She's awkward, likes computers, plays video game… hang on. Alphys is actually a pretty spot on representation of not just the typical nerd, but also of the Undertale demographic. Alphys suffers from anxiety, difficulty talking to people, as well as a lack of self esteem. However, like many a nerd, all those things melt away when she gets the chance to talk about the things she loves. Alphys is stacked up against Metaton, who very much represents the other end of the social scale. Metaton is charismatic, confident, and if you don't mind me saying, a real looker. There's the small downside of the fact that Metaton has it out for humans, but don't let that distract from his boxy charm. Despite appearances, these two are emblematic of a lot of the same ideas. Most of Hotland is spent adventuring through some pretty tricky puzzles and battles in between these big set piece encounters with Metaton where he'll mimic a classic TV show format before trying to kill you. There's a cooking show featuring human souls as the main ingredient, a news broadcast where it turns out everything is bombs and even an opera. But as luck would have it, your new friend Alphys always manages to save the day with a new gadget like this jetpack or an upgrade for your phone that makes it shoot lasers? It's it's not very clear. Over time, Alphys opens up to us about her insecurities. She talks about how she lacks self confidence, but after teaming up with us, she was able to face her fears, conquer her demons, and appreciate all the things that make her special. Does that sound familiar to anyone else? Oh, I'm sure it's nothing. Observing your progress endeared you to Alphys and was what made her decide not to kill us, in the same way interacting with other monsters got them to see us in a more favourable light. Alphys' arc is kind of like a repeat of Papyrus's, a non-violent monster learns to accept who they are by hanging out with us, right? Uh, no, it's a little bit more complicated than that. When you arrive at the core, Metaton's lair, Alphys suddenly loses all composure as things go wrong, and she bails, seemingly undoing her growth. 
It's only after you talk to Metaton before his final battle that the reason is revealed. Alphys has been lying. She asked Metaton to pretend to be a villain so that she could insert herself into your story, artificially making herself the hero. Alphys' love of video games and anime is a good thing. It's a fundamental part of her personality and should be celebrated. But instead of using fiction to ask herself who she is, what she's done or who she loves, Alphys has retreated into this childish fantasy and refuses to actually engage with the world, as encountering new ideas would mean asking herself some uncomfortable questions. Humans and monsters alike react negatively when our preconceptions are challenged, but that reaction can be even more dangerous when it's directed at ourselves. Metaton has a similar arc. Both Alphys and Metaton, who was at that point a ghost like Napsterblook, met at a human culture fan club, and it was through experiencing human stories, but more importantly getting to know Alphys and her perspective, that Metaton began to form a cohesive sense of self-identity. This culminated in Alphys building him a body that reflected this new identity in a transparent metaphor for gender transition. But just like Alphys, Metaton's good intentions went astray. He became absorbed in the inauthentic glitz and glamour of human celebrity and ended up forcing people around him to conform to an increasingly narrow worldview, and Alphys didn't make the cut. It isn't until all of Metaton's fans call in at the end of his battle that he realises he's become the inspiration for a new generation of monsters and reconnects with why he wanted to change in the first place. The mistake both Alphys and Metaton made is that they used stories to avoid learning about themselves and becoming isolated from the world. Alphys, in trying to recreate the game she loves, attempts to substitute the cliché character growth of Mew Mew Kissy Cutie for actual personal introspection. Metaton 2 tries to fill the void his friends once occupied with luxury and showbiz glam, rejecting anything that reminds him of his roots. Rather than letting stories and media give them a chance to understand more of the world and themselves, these two hide from the uncomfortable truths they'd rather not address. Alphys hides from the past, and Metaton from the person he used to be. For an alternate, much more constructive example, look at how Sans and Toriel shared a love of jokes, which, yes, are a kind of story. This mutual passion allowed for both of them to deal with their isolation in a constructive way, leading both of them to become more receptive, compassionate people who didn't, as Sans says, kill you where you stood. Unfortunately, the same can't be said for most monsters. If you've been paying attention to the stuff going on in the background, you'll have realised that monster kind is fixated on the story of the war, long after humanity has forgotten about it and moved on. Kids play humans versus monsters, They've got these obvious human murder simulators lying around, and even what passes for monster religion has become all about justifying the war. Instead of looking for new stories and new opportunities to grow, monster kind has largely isolated itself more than humans ever could, using the narrative of the war as a security blanket to ignore their problems and deflect their personal issues. But why has this gone on for so long? Surely the monsters would have moved on after hundreds if not thousands of years, right? And what's the deal with Asgore, the Monster King? As miserable as his war has made the monsters, they've got nothing but nice things to say about the guy. Well, we're about to find out, as we enter the final area. New home. But, before we can do that, Alphys has one last lie to reveal. It takes more than the power of a human soul to cross the barrier trapping the monsters underground. You'll need a human soul, plus a little bit extra. A monster soul. In order to escape, you'll need to kill Asgore. And if you don't, He'll kill you. Well, shit. The long road through the monster capital starts completely silent, giving you some much needed time to decompress after the hectic Metaton fight and the plot reveals that surrounded it. That is, until you find a house that looks spookily similar to Toriel's, except it bears all the telltale signs of her absence. That's when the monsters start appearing, and instead of trying to fight you, they tell you their story. The only one they've got. Asgore's reasons for going to war with the surface aren't born from bruised pride, greed, or even plain old anger. He's grieving. The tough part of this story is that it paints Asgore as the most sympathetic character in the whole underground. He lost everything, and he's still trying to do the right thing for those he cares about. But he's wrong. Asgore has failed to come to terms with the death of his two children at the hands of humans, and followed the same sort of path as Alphys and Metaton. In killing humans to save the underground, Asgore is trying to symbolically save Asriel and the human child. The problem is that all this will do is reinforce his trauma. In destroying human civilization, the monsters will remain isolated, many will die, and it still won't bring his kids back. We're left with an impossible choice. 
if you kill Asgul, who has every reason to feel the way he does, you undo all the work you've done to help the monsters on your journey and crush any hope they have left, proving Asgul right. But if Asgul kills you, he'll create even more suffering, justifying all the worst beliefs of monster society about humans, and he'll never be truly able to come to terms with what happened. It's kill, or be killed. Things are made even more complex when you enter the Judgment Hall, and are judged for your sins by Sans of all people. This is his real job, to judge anybody who makes it this far, and also to helpfully wrap up the themes of the game for those who miss them. Basically, EXP and love are not the simple game mechanics you thought they were, they stand for execution points and level of violence, and it's that second one that Sans has the most to say about. Love is a representation of what we talked about earlier in Waterfall, the more you kill stuff, the easier and easier it becomes to justify your violence, and the deeper you spiral into this singular obsession, the harder it becomes to see anything else. Conversely, as San says, by keeping your love at one, it means that you're open and receptive to the stories the world has to offer, and are more willing to learn from what you see and become a better, more complete person. That doesn't mean you're passive or easily manipulated, it just means that you're accepting and you have an open mind. However, Asgore's mind is closed. He surrounds himself with the golden flowers that were such a large component of his children's death, and even keeps the souls of the children he murdered close at hand, to constantly remind him of his doomed mission. Asgore is kind to you, he even gives you the time you need to get your affairs in order, but all that belies an inner stubbornness. As far as Asgore is concerned, either your death or his is inevitable, and there's nothing that can change that. And so, with no other options, you eventually agree to fight. The battle with Asgore feels… almost wrong. Unlike with Toriel, there's actually no pacifist solution, reflected by Asgore literally destroying the mercy button when he starts fighting you. Even clicking the fight button, maybe for the first time, feels like a betrayal of your values. Your remorse over being forced to fight Asgore is juxtaposed with the pumping boss music and deadly attacks to create this brilliant feeling of unease, like this shouldn't be happening. But despite that, there's a hope that eventually, there'll be a way to talk him down, evidenced by the fact that his attacks will reduce you to 1 HP before killing you, showing that somewhere, deep down, Asgore has some mercy left in him. After a hard won battle, Asgore will, eventually, collapse, and basically ask you to kill him. It's at his lowest moment that Asgore confronts the reality of what he's done and why. He's murdered six children because he can't accept the deaths of two. He's turned monster society into a war machine that attacks outsiders on the spot, just like the humans did to Azrael all those years ago. Stories don't always have happy endings, and in many ways, it's the ones that make us feel sad or angry or uncomfortable that we have the most to learn from. Asgore's story is a lesson in how even the most well-intentioned people can do the wrong thing just because they weren't willing to look inwards and maybe change. Remember that one for, uh, a little bit later. Eventually. Asgore offers you the chance to kill or spare him, but regardless of what you pick, Flowey turns up, kills Asgore, becomes God, and then crashes the game. Uh, well, um, let's boot it up again, I guess? Oh dear. Yeah, in absorbing the six human souls, Flowey has become the most powerful being in Undertale, and has wrenched back the ability to influence the world pretty much making him god. The final ingredient for his metamorphosis is the seventh and final human soul, yours. Flowey's final fight, unlike everything else, is almost deliberately devoid of depth. Yes, it's a flashy boss fight, but it's actually really quite forgiving. There's allusions to the personalities of the six human souls, but ultimately, they end up being a bit of a plot device to defeat Flowey once and for all through the power of friendship or something. It's all a bit shallow. Even once we've beaten Flowey and are offered the chance to spare or kill him, we still haven't really proven his philosophy of kill or be killed wrong. We've just… delayed it. If we kill him, not only will he be proven right, but he'll come back to life the moment we reload our save. Sparing him isn't much better. Flowey openly admits that he has no intentions of changing his ways, 
so Mercy here is just going to put us back where we started. Even the credits are a bit sombre and it's not like we get a particularly happy ending for the characters either, they're still trapped underground with no chance of freedom. But then, Flowey pops up and tells us that because we were so nice and spared him, he could get us a better ending. I mean, well that sounds like a deal that definitely doesn't have strings attached. For quite a lot of people, Undertale actually ends after the fight with Flowey, because, let's be honest, it's quite a lot of work to go through the game twice just because you killed Toriel, and I actually think that's okay, because even if you don't realise it, I think you would have already done what Undertale was trying to get you to do, trust me. For the rest of you, the true pacifist route as it's called adds a bunch of extra content that activates only after you reload your save post Flowey fight and have done some special things like not killing anyone as well as going on a date with Papyrus and Undyne. Speaking of which, the first thing on the menu is for you to deliver a letter from Undyne to Alphys, which admittedly is a bit of a step down from fighting an insane god, but it's worth it, I promise. So we go all the way back to Hotland and deliver the letter. It turns out that the letter was a romantic confession, and in only the best rom-com traditions, there's been a bit of a mix-up. What follows is a very awkward date with Alphys that ends in us role-playing a conversation with her and the person she actually likes, Undyne. This is a bit of a metaphor for what we've been doing this whole time, using a game to learn something about ourselves. Eventually, Undyne gets added to the mix in a brilliant scene, and the two have a bit of a heart to heart. Everything seems like it's worked out well, but has it really? You can bombard Alphys with all the affirmations in the world and say you love her for who she is as much as you like, but that's still not the same as actually taking the time to look inwards and ask yourself some big questions, and Alphys has finally figured that out. After being directed to her lab, Alphys tells us via the medium of what looks disturbingly like a suicide note that she's gone to face the lie she created far too long ago, and that it's something she has to do alone. She also says that if we want to learn the truth, we can go down and see for ourselves. Regardless of if you want to save Alphys, learn her dark backstory or both, the only way to proceed is to step into the elevator and descend into the darkness. Now, there is a lot to talk about in what's called the True Lab, several really crucial lore questions get answered, and a lot more get introduced. But let's start off at the beginning, with the concept of determination. Determination, supposedly, is a quality that only humans have, that allows their souls to be much more powerful than those of monsters, and this whole place was designed to extract it from the captive human souls and experiment with it. The result is, uh, these things. Amalgamates. See, injecting determination into monsters actually causes them to melt and mutate into weird composite beings of everything they used to be. This is what's traumatising Alphys, not just being directly responsible for creating the amalgamates in the first place, but the prospect of having to face their families and explaining what their dead loved ones have been turned into and who by. It's pretty easy to understand why she chose to hide from reality in the first place. The way to get past the amalgamates isn't to fight them, in fact you actually can't. Instead, you've got to help them remember who they were and come to terms with their new identity. Snowdrake's mother, for example, needs to be brought to her senses by re-familiarising her with the love of jokes, allowing her to stabilise her form enough to let you pass. Also, if you kept holding your stick from the start of the game, this dog amalgamate can be easily skipped. In the true lab we also learn some more details about the first fallen human and Azrael. It turns out that the first child coerced Azrael into a plan that involved them committing suicide and Azrael absorbing their soul, presumably as a way to break through the barrier and we know how that turned out. Also, that name you picked at the start was actually the first child's name. We also learned that Alphys was unwittingly responsible for the creation of Flowey. Speaking of Alphys, eventually, after a close call with some hungry amalgamates, we meet up with her, and Alphys says she left the note not because she wanted to die, but because she was afraid the fear of coming clean would keep her down here forever. But thanks to the support of those around her, Alphys has had the chance to learn about herself and more importantly change for the better. She's become a woman who's able to face failure head on and stop deceiving herself, and she never would have done that had she not been exposed to the stories the world had to offer and used the knowledge they gave her to direct positive growth. Alphys' story finally gets the happy ending it deserves, and with that, we've done all the steps we need to do in order to claim the happy ending the reformed Flowey promised us. If we go back to Asgore and try to fight him, things start out the same way. Same intro, same badass opening theme, same terrible choice in front of us. But then, Toriel turns up and saves the day, followed by everyone else. As you might expect, 
This was all a ploy by Flowey to gather all the monsters in one place, so he could steal their souls as well as all the human souls, allowing him to ascend to his true form. Asriel Dreamer, the son of Toriel and Asgore. Asriel slash Flowey is the final enemy in the game, and as such, represents the antithesis of everything Undertale wants you to understand. Asriel is an embodiment of the refusal to learn and a refusal to change. In baiting you in with the promise of a better ending and constantly resetting the world, Asriel ensures that he can carry on playing childish games with his friend forever, indicated by the fact that you literally can't lose this fight. But what's weird is that when you listen to his petulant demands of you and his way too edgy names for things, God of Hyper Death, really, we realise that Azriel isn't threatening. He's almost pitiable, really. Both as a flower and as his true self, Azriel's entire worldview is simplistic and stunted. He never grew up and doesn't want to face the realities of the world or who he's become. Azriel resets our friends back to the way they were when we first met them but we can restore them by giving them opportunities to question their old selves. We show Undyne our peaceful intent, allowing her to change her opinion of humans once again. We remind Toriel and Asgore that the love of their children will never leave, allowing the two to move past their deaths for the second time. And we show Alphys that she needn't be ashamed of who she is, allowing her to triumph over self-doubt for good this time. Flowey slash Asriel, on the other hand, has spent so long literally running away from everything that could ever possibly challenge him and seemingly spending every waking moment trying to convince himself that his obviously flawed ideology is right, that he's lost even those basic self-analysis abilities that we learned in the tutorial. The only way to end this endless battle is to teach Asriel, ideally with the help of magic rainbow powers, how to look inwards and grow as a person, just as Undertale taught us. By now, the pattern should be obvious. Stories, whatever their form, Songs, books, jokes, games, the stories of people's lives even, can tell us so much about ourselves, but true personal growth has to come from within. Undertale excels at unearthing biases and opinions you didn't even know you had. For example, the question Undone asks you about whether anime is real or not sneaks in some complex morality about the ethics of lying for the greater good and the subjective nature of belief whilst pretending to be a joke. With every question Undertale asks of you, you get a new opportunity to affirm your beliefs or change for the better. In meeting and making friends with all these monsters, they've also learned about themselves and have decided to change. Not just the named characters, but all the side monsters too. Where once they were all simply baddies defined by attack patterns, HP totals and maybe a pun for a name if they were lucky, now they're able to determine their own identities. See what I'm getting at? Determination is the ability to change or determine who you are and the only way to make that choice is to learn about yourself through, you guessed it, stories. Without stories to direct our personal growth, we'd end up like these guys. Monsters have had determination this whole time, Undyne even knows she does, we just had to help them realise it. The message of Undertale, if you want to call it that, isn't really a message, it's more of an imperative. Undertale doesn't demand you learn a specific thing or come to a particular conclusion, all that it wants is for you to learn something and become a better person for it. It doesn't matter whether it got you to think about the ethics of violence, about family, grief, whether you prefer butterscotch or cinnamon, all Undertale asks is that you learn from it. Once he's finally been worn down and forced to confront himself, Asriel relents. He lets his twisted game finish and returns to his childlike inner form, honest with who he is and the growing up he needs to do. With this knowledge in hand, and with the awakened determination of the monsters within him, Asriel shatters the barrier and sets everyone free. By now, both your job of setting the monsters free and Undertale's job of communicating the relationship between people and stories is done. And a good thing too, because this particular story is over. Once the barrier is shattered, you're kicked back out into the overworld and are given a chance to say goodbye to everyone. You can wander through the various worlds and you can see how everyone has changed for the better. For example, the Snowdrake family has learned to accept each other through a mutual love of comedy. Sunderplane has realised that they weren't really in love with the player after all, and Froggit has learned just that little bit more about the universe. But if there's one thing every monster has in common, it's that they talk about this being the end of their life in the underground and moving on. A pretty obvious hint, 
for what you should really be doing. Remember that bit in the tutorial where Toriel tests your independence after explaining the basics to you? That's what's happening here. Undertale has armed you with the basics of narrative theory and given you a few really great starting points for you to go out into the big wide world on your own. It helps you take that first step, but the rest as they say, is for you to determine. In my first playthrough of Undertale, I reacted really quite strongly to the way Alphys used her gaming passion to hide from her personality flaws. That prompted me to adopt a new philosophy when it came to my love of games. I wouldn't just passively absorb them, I'd try and learn something about myself or about game design from each one I played, and eventually, I started writing those observations down. Yeah, without Undertale, I might not have even gotten started with this whole YouTube thing. It seems Toby Fox, at least partially, used Undertale to help come to terms with making the Earthbound Halloween hack, a basically pretty bad and way too edgy ROM hack he's on record as regretting making, representing it as one of the sad, forgotten about amalgamates which looks a bit like Gigaius, the final boss of Earthbound. And if you go right to the very start of the game, through the big doors to the ruins, and back to the patch of flowers where you first landed, even Asriel, here all on his own, has had a chance to learn from his sad story, and in a small way, change. But eventually, if you exhaust his dialogue, he's only got one thing left to say to you. Don't you have anything better to do? And of course you do! There's a whole world out there for you and the monsters to explore, just outside the barrier. There you get to watch Papyrus drive a car for real, Undyne and Alphys make out, Asgore and Toriel starting to move on with their separate lives, and everyone being happy on the surface. There's even a little fake out ending before Toby Fox says thanks to all the people that made this story possible. And then, there we have it, the end. But that isn't the end. At least not for some people. After finishing the game and booting it back up, Asriel appears and asks you not to reset the game, telling you that everyone is happy and that the story is over. But that isn't enough for some people. After all, there are loads of unanswered questions. What's the first Fallen Humans deal? How did Flowey gain the ability to manipulate the timeline? What's Sans's weird fourth wall breaking deal? Or simply, what happens if we intentionally defy the game and start killing everyone? Resetting your progress means consciously choosing not just to subject all the characters to the events of Undertale all over again, but to reset your own progress in learning about stories and growing because of them. Because you clearly haven't learned anything. You've become just like Flowey. Originally, I was going to talk quite a bit about the genocide route, but I think that would have been a mistake. For those who don't know, the so-called genocide route is the alternate ending where you kill every possible enemy instead of making friends with every possible enemy. See, in plumbing Undertale's depths in order to find the mythical, real, true ending where you can save Asriel, or find out all the lore details like whatever WD Gaster is supposed to be, you sacrifice actually learning something about yourself from the game. The genocide route is a trap, the same one that Alphys, Metaton, Asriel, Asgore and a bunch of other people fell into. It requires you to treat Undertale like a regular RPG, closing yourself off not just to the evidence to the contrary, but all the monsters telling you to stop, and even your own lack of fun. The combat in Undertale is… really boring, and you have to do a lot of it in the genocide run to even start reaching new content. That new content is a revamped Undyne fight, and a whole new final boss battle against Sans. They're okay, I guess. But most of the difficulty, particularly in the Sands battle, comes from the janky controls that were never really built for fighting in the first place, and that's kind of the point. You aren't supposed to be doing the genocide run, and your reward for beating Sands? You don't even get the catharsis of killing Flower yourself, the game takes away control there, and then you're treated to an encounter with the first fallen child which doesn't answer any plot questions and permanently taints your save file ruining any future pacifist endings with a violent twist. It's a hollow, frustrating, pointless experience Undertale did everything it could to stop you from playing, but it can't make you grow. It can't make you change. Only you can, but instead you've tried to find a lesson in Undertale when it makes clear it wants you to find one in yourself. Which is a shame, really. Because for all the people who, MatPat to this day, continue to obsess about Undertale, MatPat, whilst also simultaneously missing the point completely, MatPat, there's a whole world of people out there who've been inspired to grow or change or make something new as a result of their time with the game. From art, to spin-off fanfics, song remixes, or even whole new games. These people have embraced the story of Undertale, taken away something from it, and have grown as artists, writers, musicians, or just plain old people as a result. 
even Toby Fox has learned from Undertale. Deltarune, the follow-up game, shows clear signs of improvement over its predecessor. The combat has much more depth, the writing is snappier, and the pacing is much more consistent, but the influence is still there, clear to see. The influence our time in the underground has had on us will never leave, because we use the stories it had to tell us to become who we are today. But, and it might be uncomfortable to admit, we've learned all we can from Undertale. It's time to move on. After gathering all the footage I needed for Undertale, I took my save file, put it in a folder, and then uninstalled the game. Almost certainly for good. Undertale shattered the barrier for us, and now it's time to step out onto the surface. Hi, hello, and thank you for watching all the way to the end. This was a hell of a video to make, so um, sorry about it taking a whole month to do. Wow. Hopefully you enjoyed it, and if you did and would like to see other similar videos, hopefully on a more regular basis, then why don't you throw me some money on Patreon? I promise it will go almost exclusively towards buying chocolate and salt and vinegar crisps. In addition to funding my snacking, top tier supporters get a shout out, and those people are Samuel Vanderplatz, Alex Deloch, Dirk Jan Karenbeld, Ray's Dad, Joshua Binswanger, Lunar Eagle 1996, Ivar Olofsson, Leet 2, Philippe Hintzen, Daniel Metges, Lucas Slack, Strateger in Ultima, Patrick Romberg, Baxter Heel, William Johansson, Brian Natariani, Asaran, Jonathan Kirkinson, and Chow. Thank you for your continued support over the last year, and I'm really looking forward to what the channel has to offer for 2019. So, uh, watch this space. Um, I don't script these, so I'm not really sure what to say. So, um, uh, bye.